Hey, everybody. This is Stephanie Ruper. Thank you for tuning in to the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we re-examine what we think we know to construct even better ideas. Today is episode number 23, and it is a continuation of episode number two in which we're having a conversation with Donald Crosby. Now, if you did not listen to episode number 22, I do highly recommend tuning into it before listening to this one. It is because it is a conversation with the same person and is, in fact, is ongoing. We didn't have a stopping point at the end of the last episode. Rather, I just, I just cut our conversation in half and, and split it into two different episodes. So uh, Professor Donald Crosby, Dr. Crosby, We'll be back in this episode to spend more time discussing specifically his religious vision of nature, the way in which he views nature as spiritually fulfilling and providing solace to us as well as obligation to one another and to other species. And it's, it's a really beautiful vision. So I will I will just I will just send you along to it. Here is the continuation of our previous discussion with Donald Crosby. There are I think a lot of very intellectually interesting ways, you know, to sort of find consonance between science and theological worldviews and mm-hmm. all that all those sorts of things. I think they're all very interesting but I also am not particularly persuaded by them. I think most people, many people would bring up this idea of faith and -hmm. would say, well, you, you believe anyway, because, because, Mm -hmm. right. Because it's called for you or because you want to, or just, just because, Uh, which is actually very interesting because in the West today, we tend to think of faith as believing in something without, reason or without empirical reason, right? We think of that today, but that's actually a pretty limited way of thinking about faith. And there are many other ways to think about faith. And you in particular have a a different way of thinking about faith. So what is, what is your idea about what faith actually is? Well, I can tell various stories about this, but uh, suppose someone invites me to go on a parachute jump. Now, I might strongly believe that parachutes can support people from 10,000 feet and that they'll fall gently to earth. But putting my life at stake by actually jumping out of the plane is something quite different. So faith is not just a set of doctrines or beliefs. It's committing your whole life to a certain vision of the world and your place within the world. Mm. Your whole bounded life from birth to death with this proposition that this is the ultimate meaning of human life. So you need to have very good reasons to do that. And the question is, are the reasons for belief in God in light of all the objections to belief in God sufficiently convincing for you to base your life on them? So faith is an existential stance. Beliefs are epistemological thing. Mm. And the other part of this is you can't believe by being commanded to believe. You can't even will yourself to believe something you're not convinced of or persuaded by. Yeah, that's, that's you interesting. Do this with your faith and your beliefs that you can. And what is plausible to me may not be plausible to someone else. And I respect people who believe in God and feel that they have good reasons to believe in God. And I think they get some things out of that belief that I don't get out of religion or nature. Mm. But I do have this assurance. I can talk to people like you, and you and I can have an I-thou relationship. We can reassure and help one another, help to examine our neutral assumptions and so on. So there are all kinds of vows in nature, not just human vows, but the vows of my cat and dog and other creatures of nature. So nature is full of purpose of beings. It doesn't have a purpose overall in itself, but it is full of purpose of beings. 
And there are a lot of reasons to live one's life and a lot of reasons not to commit suicide. Uh, okay, so what what are some of those reasons, right? Because we're talking about purpose, and I, I love the way you talk about purpose in, in all these different creatures and actually existing in, in the world, and, and that is a significant part of the reason to live one's life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where, where, is the, where is the purpose located, and how do we relate to it? Well, one of the answers to that question is uh, we find in our relationships with others, other human beings, as well as animals, a kind of uh, fulfillment, a kind of pleasure, a kind of joy, um, without which life would be, if not meaningless, devoid of much meaning. Aristotle says the most important experience of life is friendship. Mm -hmm. And without friendship, life would be bare and devoid of much of its meaning. So we find in our imminent relations, here and now relations with others, much of the meaning of our lives. And we shouldn't despair of that. We should affirm that and we'll seek deeper and more meaningful relations as life goes on. And the meaning for relation is not just one in which I find sustenance for fulfillment in my relation to you, but a life in which I am able to contribute to your sustenance and fulfillment. So right. the, the meaning of life, as I put it in one place, is not its duration, but its donation. Yeah, that um, I find I find very interesting. So I tend to think about religion and most things in our world in very functional terms, which means mm -hmm. I think about them in terms of what they do for or to us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I see religion as, as performing these functions for people psychologically, right? Mm -hmm. And doing X, Y, and Z things. And I have this list here that I'm looking at now and that I've been looking at for years of all of the ways in which your religion of nature sort of performs the same functions, right? It does a lot of the same things about religion, and I, I'm assuming that I, that's that's an important part um, of of your of your vision. And we didn't even talk about interpretive theories of religion, which I also think is great. It's another mm -hmm. another book, um, the first the first of yeah. uh, Don's books. Uh, but so there is for you one thing that religions do is give people a moral code or a moral imperative right and for you there is a demand made on us like we are obligated mm -hmm. as a species to take you know to take care of people and other species and so can you tell me a little bit about where that demand comes from and what constitutes constitutes it well, that demand comes, for one thing, by realization that we're part of a larger community, um, a family almost, of all the creatures of the world. We're linked to all of them by the thread of DNA, which every creature from the smallest to the largest possesses and gives it its character. So if you're part of a community, it's not only a privilege, it's also a responsibility to contribute to the life of that community to the fullest extent possible. So if you invite me into your home to live for a period of time, you would rightly expect me to wash the dishes from time to time, prepare the meal, uh, make up the beds, sweep the floor, and so on. So with life and community comes not only privilege, but responsibility. I mean, that seems to be axiomatic. So if we really are a community and not just isolated atoms, then we have responsibilities to one another. And uh, Aristotle is again, my guide, we're social creatures. We're not spiders and leopards, we're social beings. We need one another. And if you need me and I need to contribute to your need, and if I need you, I hope that you will contribute to mine. So that doesn't seem to be an extremely problematic idea. Mm. <laughs> and, and religion of nature has three basic 
um, components. Mm -hmm. One is assurance. I'm at home here. I belong here. I'm among friends here. I don't have to pine for another world. The second one is demand, what we just talked about. There are all kinds of very exquisite demands placed upon us as uh, proponents of religion of nature. And then the third one is empowerment. Where do we get the power to meet these demands and to live in this way? And there we are introduced to an idea that we call the Christian idea of grace, but it's actually not just Christian. The Buddha wandered for six years and sat down in exhaustion under the Bodhi tree, and he suddenly experienced enlightenment. Well, he had prepared the way to be sure, but the enlightenment came as an event of grace. And there are all kinds of events of grace in nature, that if we open ourselves to them and are receptive to them and the sensitive to them, can enlarge and enrich our lives. I like that. I really like that idea of empowerment. I don't, I hadn't, I hadn't remembered that that was such a key piece of it. And this is, I think a lot about the assurances and the demand piece of this and have actually written about it extensively because I think it's, I think it's very important in religions and for us to be called in a sense to something and then yes. in return to be receiving um, some sort of solace and so you mentioned not being alone and knowing that you're not pining for another world like in what other ways is the is there solace um maybe perhaps specifically you could talk a little bit about death like where is the solace what um <clears throat> are surrounding the ideas about dying well if i think about uh, being a natural being my brain working in concert with other parts of my body, interactions with the world enables me to be conscious and to be aware of all the things around me. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is a great gift and I find a solace in having that gift and I would feel very depraved or deprived lacking that gift of consciousness, conscious awareness. And I have deep empathy with people who do not have that and and have that only in a very narrow, constricted sense. Mm -hmm. So I find the solace in being conscious. I also find the solace in being conscious of being part of this larger community of nature and having responsibility for it, being able to affect it for good or ill. So I'm needed in nature. I'm not just superfluous and I'm not just off on the edge, especially as a human species. I can have calamitous effects on nature, quite unlike most other species, although the insects could do us in within a few weeks, probably, if they cease to exist. So if we want something that is really hegemonic and primordial, it would have to be the insects, not us, as far as nature is concerned. And I think nature could do quite well without us entirely. One writer, I think it was Elizabeth Sotora says, uh, nature may have, may have made a big mistake with the big brain experiment. You know, we can be a real threat to the integrity of nature. Yeah. So that the solace that we are needed, but also demand in which we're needed to do the right things in the right way. Another part of living my life as a finite being bounded by birth and death around it by a sleep, as Shakespeare puts it, is that I have the opportunity in the course of my life to contribute to the world, to the ongoingness of the world, to future generations, not only of human beings, but of all species. And uh, that is a tremendously uh, satisfying realization. One reason I write the books that I write, and I've written too many by now, is I want to contribute as much as I can out of my own experience to the well-being of the world after I'm gone, assuming that someone somewhere like you might read one or more of my books. So we find the solace in being a part of the world that needs us and that needs our contributions within the span of our life here and now. 
Yeah, I I find that to be very important for me personally and is also why I write books. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and it has been sort of the anchor of of my ability to live my life without despair is feeling like there is acknowledging that there is value in the world right mm-hmm. and i have the power to contribute to it and, yes. and so and so i am obligated right i i, I can and i should uh, and so i i appreciate i appreciate that so much in your works i it feels borderline existentialist you know it, it does feel a little bit like sart from time to time choose what you will with your with your mm-hmm. radical freedom uh but mm-hmm. but for you the difference for you is that you're grounding it in something that you say is real value is real whereas it's yeah. not completely constructed. That transcends me yeah. yeah you know the sort if you think about it is a modern descartes because descartes thought that the only thing you could be assured of is his existence at one moment mm. God had to recreate him at the previous moment and the future moment. So there was no connection between and among the moments of his life. So he had a disconnected, atomistic view of life and of himself. Well, that's not a very reassuring kind of certainty. The only thing I can be assured of is right now, nothing previous, nothing following. And uh, Sartre is like that, you see. His absolute freedom is a freedom only in the moment, because the past can have no influence on it, and I can't really influence the future for the same reason. So the only existence I have is in this discrete moment. Well, if you think about time, there's no such thing as discrete moments. Every present moment draws upon the past, is influenced by the past, contributes to the future. So time flows from the past through the present into the future. And if you think about it that way, then um, this whole notion of existential freedom, radical, absurd freedom, is truly absurd. Mm -hmm. Not only because we're affirming absurdity, because it's absurd to affirm it in that way. Yeah, that's really smart. I forgot <laughs> I forgot that you said that. And I really... <laughs> I forgot too. I had to remind myself <laughs> before this interview. <laughs> uh, I know. I, and I was, I was looking at the things I wanted to talk to you about. I was like, God, he wrote this book, you know, 40 years ago. Um, so yes, thank you. And I think, I think that that's very important to remember uh, that we are so much constituted by what is happening and, and your metaphors about flow, I think mm-hmm. uh, in a sense, they're, they're a little bit Taoist, right? Sort of letting yourself or the yes. acknowledgement of your place within the flow of time or the cosmos. Taoism is the closest approximation to religion of nature mm. and judgment. So I have a lot of respect for it. And I love the fact that the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. Because no matter what I say about nature, no matter how extensive or even well-reasoned, I can't begin to do justice to it. That's beautiful. <laughs> I appreciate that. I didn't, I didn't know that. But I also, uh, I find Taoism to be, to be quite compelling. And I, I do really appreciate it. I spent a little bit of time in my master's degree toying with studying Taoism for mm-hmm. a living. I decided against that. I had already learned Mandarin. I didn't want to learn classical Chinese as well. Oh, you did learn some. <laughs> <laughs> um, some. Well, I, I, had, I had studied Chinese previously, actually. So mm-hmm. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't starting from nothing. But mm-hmm. yeah, Taoism uh, is, is different from the religion of nature but but definitely definitely there are consonances and yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the, we, have to, we have to distinguish philosophical Taoism from practice Taoism in China yeah, the philosophical is a little different it's like comparing Thomas Aquinas to uh, uh, Billy Graham <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a philosophy joke there yes um, <laughs> I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you uh, because there are parts of Taoism that are about trying to live forever, right? And, and stuff like that. And that's definitely not 
definitely not what you're about or what philosophical you know, doubt is about. Or death is so good in Taoism, in the Shang Tzu. Uh, there is a skull along the road, and someone comes along and the skull starts talking. Mm -hmm. The skull says, you know, being dead is not really that bad. It's really kind of enjoyable. And he laughs. And the person by the side of the road is really taken aback by this attitude toward death. That we live only to die. And the skull is saying, so what? <laughs> I like that. I like how much that makes you laugh. <laughs> I, that's, that's very nice. So, <laughs> uh, back, back to the religion of nature, there are, I, this is interesting. So another thing that, okay, so a little bit of explanatory background for listeners. There are many people currently engaged in trying to construct new worldviews, right? Moving beyond the spiritual and religious transformations that have been happening in light of science and the development of the West and all this stuff, you know, the globalized world, uh, all this, all of this change is happening. And many people are thinking about how we can relate to the world in a, mm -hmm. in a different way. And uh, Don has created this one system but one thing that is, there are many things that are unique about this system and why I actually I don't know if I should go on the record saying this, but I'm going to say it, it is my preferred system of, of all of them. My preferred system. Uh, one, one of the things you have that most don't is a symbol system. You have religious symbols and, and talking about Taoism made me think about that because when I think about Taoism, I think about the river of time. And I also see the symbol, you know, I see the symbol of the Tao uh, in my head. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, and I actually haven't read your book on symbols. It's one of the only ones I haven't read. And so I'm wondering if you could fill me in a little bit about uh, what sort of symbols you find in nature or what sort of things do you think are important to symbolize? And then what, what, what do you do? Well, one of the things that I take from Taoism is the symbolism of water. Mm. Because water suffuses things, you know, it, you can't contain it or stop it. It's, it's volatile. Mm. It's like uh, Heraclitus, River of Time. And uh, in one of my books, I think it's a symbolism book, I talk about water. I talk about the waterfall, which has the volatility of nature, the changeableness, the creation and destruction of nature, what I call the uh, natura naturans as opposed to nature and naturata, nature naturing. So water has that volatile character. And then it has, at the bottom of the waterfall, there's a river that flows, which is like the river of time. And all of us are immersed in that flow of time within the boundedness of our life. And then finally it ends up at a lake, which is placid and calm and beautiful and reassuring. And you can imagine the lake in a moonlit night, the serenity, the sublimity of that experience. So what I suggest in that book is every time you take a drink of water, let that be a symbol, a ritual of your connectedness with nature. Hmm. Do you, that was beautiful. Do you have other symbols that you want to enlighten me and us with? Well, sometimes we think of symbols in terms of the founders of a religious tradition or the great contributors to a religious tradition. And the one that I think of as a kind of masterful symbol analogous to the Jesus of the Gospels is John Muir. Because he was such an exquisite naturalist and he thought of nature as a cathedral within which all of these wonderful things were taking place. And he was so delighted to be a part of that and to experience that. And of course, he contributed to the uh, setting up of great national parks like Yosemite. So he talked about the, man, the mountains singing in joy in the morning, you know. And, and uh, he just had that sense of connection with nature and attention to nature 
that I regard as very religious, very deeply religious. So he's sort of a symbol to me of the kind of life that one should live as a proponent of religion of nature. That doesn't mean we have to go up in the mountains and live and be hermits, but in, we need to appreciate all these things that surround us. And the problem with uh, nature is it's so constant, so dependable, and so familiar, we tend not to notice it, you know. It's like uh, your partner in love, you're sometimes tempted to take for granted this partner in love. And then the partner is gone and uh, doesn't return for a period of time, and you realize how much you need that partner, how much you admire that partner, how much you want that partner to be part of your life. And I think deep within us is uh, what uh, one ecologist calls uh, biophilia. This is uh, biophilia is the love of the bios, the love of nature, the sense of connectedness with it. We need to awaken that sense and nurture that sense, cultivate that sense, spread that sense as best we can. Right. So this idea of biophilia is E.O. Wilson's, and there's a chapter on Wilson in my dissertation. Aha, uh -huh, good. And I, I find the idea of biophilia to be really interesting because the basic argument is that humans do have an intrinsic affinity for nature and, you know, for some parts more than others. But mm -hmm. we, growing up in our synthetic modern environments, we mm -hmm. actually, we've just never been able to properly experience it. And so we don't we don't really have it. And so it's actually something that if you open yourself up to can become really rewarding, but you have to sort of dare to step into that space. You know, we're no longer children, That's exactly. around, you know, we're not running around in the dirt the way that kids did for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Right. And so there is a, a deep spiritual resource available in mm -hmm. nature right but if we just if we don't feel it now it's probably just because we've never really been exposed to it's it it's well stated and i think children who play outside have it kind of naturally that feeling i remember it very vividly but as you get older you tend to distance yourself from that it's it, it's something like this let's say a child has a potential to be a great piano player and that child is never given lessons in piano, never has a piano in the home and so on. So the potentiality is here, but it has to be awakened and it has to be practiced. That's and that's a, what you're yeah. talking about. That's a very, yeah, it's a good analogy. I, I, I find that useful and it has to be awakened and it has to be. Has so the biophilia is there as a potentiality, but you have to develop it. Right. And then you can sort of the sense of the senses of solace and of demand, right, or obligation that responsibility that we're talking about here, they actually probably come much more naturally if you spend time yes and engaging in nature right um i mean you don't have to you can live in a city and be a perfectly good religious naturalist right mm -hmm. but uh, if you do those sorts of things then these sort of effective emotional bonds or whatever can mm -hmm. more easily develop yeah that's right that's right sorry i thought you were gonna say something <laughs> well um i was trying to think of the author of pilgrim at tinker creek but anyway, she does that in an exquisite way. Um, 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 I know, I want to say her name is Anne. No. Dillard. Annie Dillard. Thank you. <laughs> Annie Dillard. We got there. See, she is an example of what we're talking about, practicing yeah. the presence of nature. In the same way that people used to practice the presence of God. Right, right. Okay, so like, so now, now we're in the modern world and people are longing for answers. The 
podcasts that I put up that are about spiritually without religion are some of the most popular ones, right? There's definitely this, definitely this longing. And so what can, you know, what exactly can this, how can this religious vision, you know, reach them and, and how can it sort of also meet our, I don't want to say political needs, but you're talking again, you're talking about obligation. Can it help us, you know, relate to nature in a way that can solve some of the crises that we're in? I know those are two big questions. Yeah. Well, one of the things to realize is that the, is that the approach to religion of nature is not just individual by individual. It has to do with structure. Mm. It has to do with politics. It has to do with social relationships. So um, proponents of a religion of nature should be working for structures that subserve nature. Because we're not here to be served by nature. We're here to serve nature in the context of religion of nature. And you serve nature politically as well as individually. When I was in seminary, we had a professor, my most beloved professor, who said, God is a politician. And we sort of gasped and wondered what in the world could he mean by that, given the low esteem of politicians in our culture. And he said, because God is concerned with the whole of life. And religion of nature is concerned with the whole of life, and that includes politics, and it includes education, and it includes ordinary vocations, all the ways in which we contribute to the betterment of the world. And we certainly have to have a keen ear to political developments. And uh, the political developments that suppress our obligation to nature need to be resisted to the nail. And there are a lot of those in American culture today, as you know, American political culture. But we need responsible government, responsible to nature, and we need to support that in every way we can. Yeah, that's... One of, one of the ways in which I celebrate religion of nature is vegetarianism. And I confess that I'm not a vegan, I'm a vegetarian, so I eat, uh, uh, I drink milk and I eat eggs and cheese and so on. And it's not because I don't think being a vegan is important, I think it is. I just don't have sufficient resolution for it at present. But the, the, the reason I do it is partly because of all the violence that is done to animals across the world. Billions of chickens and hogs and cows are slaughtered for human consumption. And they fart and they belch and they contribute methane to the atmosphere. They eat the grains that if we ate the grains ourselves would be much more efficient. So there are a variety of reasons for being a vegetarian, but maybe we can find ways in our personal life to express and ritualize our commitment to religion of nature. Yeah, I like that you're coupling the personal commitment with also the systemic yes <laughs> power structures yes yeah yes. i th i think i think both are i also think that that both are important so uh we're talking about functions that religion performs and the religion of nature uh what there i think the biggest difference is that if you're a christian of pretty much any denomination you can walk into a church and know a, you're going to have community, and B, you're going to know like what kind of rituals you're encountering, and you're going to be encountering rituals that have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so there is a real challenge in these sorts of creating these kinds of visions because, because they don't come with rituals and they don't come with community. And so how do you sort of see those challenges being addressed or playing out in the world? Do we have to wait for yeah, people lost, to lost part people? of you? We went off the air for a minute. So say it again. State it again. Um, well, where did you lose me? Ritual. Um, I'll say the whole thing. So, um, mm -hmm. one of the functions that religion performs is 
providing people with, well, two things, community and ritual. Yes. And when, say, you're a Christian of any faith, when you walk mm-hmm. into a church, A, you're going to have community, and B, you know that you're going to encounter a set of rituals that have been around for ages and ages mm-hmm. and ages, mm-hmm. right? And so I think one of the biggest challenges to this kind of worldview, to a religion of nature, is finding these kinds of ritual and community are really important to people, right? So how do you sort of envision there being a a burgeoning of ritual and or community with these kinds of worldviews? Do we have to wait for that to happen? Like, how does that happen? Do you have ideas about what kind of rituals could be done? Well, you mentioned uh, Ursula Goodenough. She's the president of the religious RNA, Religion of Nature Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is encouraging people in their local areas to have small groups in which they begin to discuss how to institutionalize a religion of nature. But I think proponents of a religion of nature can also do this in existing institutions. Uh, My wife and I just joined the Methodist Church, for example. Wow. uh, Our beliefs are quite different from most people in the Methodist Church. But we think that our beliefs are uh, pointers to a way to live religiously in the future, not necessarily as a religious naturalist, but at least with accommodations of traditional theism to ecological crisis and so on. Mm -hmm. So we try to bear witness as much as we can to this deep commitment to nature, love of nature, responsibility to nature within that context. But if you think about it, you know, all of the religions of the world have been transformations of pre-existing religions. Uh, Judaism was transformation of aspects of Canaanite and Egyptian culture, for example. Christianity was transformation of Judaism, Islam of Christianity and Judaism. And uh, we see a kind of ongoing uh, interrelation of Taoism and Buddhism and Confucianism in China. So religion is something volatile, always changing, and always developing. And you can't live in the past. We can't live in the three-tiered universe of the first century. And if you can't do that, there are a lot of other things you can't do. A lot of that language and culture, belief, assumption has to be translated over the span of 2,000 years. You take into account as much as you can of that past, but you look toward the future and try to live in the future. And you can only live toward the future authentically when you live in the present authentically. So I was talking to uh, John Cobb, who is a famous process theologian. And he said, you know, 2000 years from now, Buddhism and Christianity might be indistinguishable. And I said, well, how could that possibly be? And he said, because they continue to dialogue and converse with one another and develop one another's perspectives until they finally end up in one place. So if you think about it that way, and if you think about religion as always changing and developing, there are a lot of institutional expressions of religion already, and a lot of ready-made symbols and founders and traditions within those traditions that can be appropriated. The one I like to think about it is one that I came up with, the image of the cross. The cross, this points toward the sky, and then we point toward the earth, and then we point out outward to all the creatures of the earth. And that's our orientation. Uh, the sky gives us all that we need in the way of water and refreshment and heat and light. The earth gives us support of all the minerals of the earth and we give support to one another as this broader uh, creation. So these symbols don't just stand in one place, they can be transformed over time. You are so good at symbols. That is such a nice symbol. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, yeah, and I think a really elegant demonstration of how we can meld these traditions, you know, I often, I think 
so much of the problem we have in today's religious and political climate is that people are terrified that the alternative viewpoint is going to, it's posing a threat to their view, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that science, for example, will destroy Christianity. Uh, I think that that's actually a very prominent feeling that a lot of people have. And so I think it's important that we promote this idea that there can be real consonance that doesn't actually sacrifice the core of what's mm -hmm. happening in either tradition, right? They can actually come together in a way that is mutually beneficial. And if you think of the doctrines as um, adjuncts to a way of life, religion as a way of life, and the doctrines may need to change over time to reflect our ongoing experience of ways of life in the world. And the most important thing to me about you as a person is you are a human being, not that you're a Buddhist or a monk or a Muslim or something else. The doctrines right on the surface of your being and beliefs are not the same thing as faith. So I might find within you deep analogies to my faith, even though we call it become something different. You see what I'm saying? And this institution, think about the Protestant Reformation. I mean, it radically transformed Christianity. And uh, Christianity radically transformed Judaism. So all these religions are amenable to transformation. And there, it's necessary that they undergo transformation. Now, globalization is both a threat and a promise, you know. It's a threat because here is someone who has a belief very different from my own, and yet I have to live in proximity to that person. And uh, how do I do that? Well, I can resist that person. I can try to con convert him or her to my beliefs, or I can be deeply interested in that person's outlook and expect to learn a lot from it. And maybe we can mutually transform one another. Mm -hmm. The best book that I've read of all this slide is by John Cobb, and it's called Buddhism and Christianity Toward a Mutual Transformation. He does a wonderful job of showing things in Buddhism that Christians were not sufficiently aware of, and vice versa. So they learn from each other, and they transform their respective traditions together. Mm. That's the hope of the world, as far as religion is concerned, for me at least. I agree with you. I also, I am hopeful. I am hopeful in value change and symbol change and the lessening of the experience of threat and uncertainty. All of these things, they're deeply complex issues, but for better or for worse, they're the way forward. You know, yeah. it's what it's what we have to do unless there's some massive catastrophe that pushes us over the ledge. Uh, and that's also plausible, you know, but it really is it really is the hope. And therefore, I will continue right in, in Christianity. There is often this idea of the kingdom, right? Someday mm -hmm. there will be the kingdom. But I happen to believe in kingdom ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and kingdom is a political metaphor. <laughs> that very, very much is, yes. <laughs> and it does have very specific roots in specific yes. cultures in the yes. Christian tradition. We translate it. We don't talk about kingdoms in this country, but we have political institutions. Yeah. Right. So it is our obligation to build the democratic, somewhat utopian vision that we <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I have any more questions. Are there any other things that you want to uh, explore or talk well, about or ask me? Quite a few. <laughs> it's sufficient for both of us to think about for a while. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I enjoyed yeah. talking to you. Thank you.